Good day. I'm making this video on what is the third day of the Ukrainian offensive in Kherson region. And there are, by the way, as I make this video, rumours that Ukraine is now thinking about yet another offensive in Kharkiv region as well. There's apparently been evidence of some sort of build-up of Ukrainian forces in Kharkiv region and some sources on the Russian side anticipate that this is in preparation for an offensive against the Russian-held town of Izium. Now, I will say that a couple of days ago, there were reports that General Zaluzhny, the Ukrainian uh, general who's in overall command of the Ukrainian armed forces, apparently advised President Zelensky that an offensive towards Kherson region was a bad idea and suggested instead that a, an offensive towards Izium as a place where prospects of success would be greater. Well, if that was General Zelensky's advice, we see what has happened. And it's not unusual when dealing with um, civilians instead of civilians in these sort of situations, I suppose, which is that um, when you offer one option as an alternative to another, the person you make that offer to then insists on executing both at one and the same time. So the result is that Ukraine may, and I stress may because we don't yet know that there is going to be an offensive in Kharkov region. Ukraine may be straining itself in two different locations, launching offensives or counter-offensives in both occasions, uh, in, both pla in two different places, in Kherson region and in Kharkov region, whereas perhaps given its relatively limited resources, it might have been better advised to concentrate on one. Anyway, that brings me to what is actually going on in Kherson region. And I said that this was, today is the third day of the Ukrainian offensive. And of course, we still get news trickles in about what's happening there. And I have to say, if we're talking about detailed discussions of operations, of events on the ground. Nearly all the information up to now that one can work with, at least, is coming from the Russian side. And I'm now just going to uh, repeat a read from a Russian Defence Ministry report um, of what's been happening with this Ukrainian offensive in Kherson region. Now, I want to stress this is a Russian report. It's not a Ukrainian report. The Ukrainians no doubt could give a different account of things or would give a different account of things. But as of this moment in time, they're not saying very much, which is why we are looking at what the Russians are saying. And the Russians say this, an attempt by the Zelensky regime, that's how they refer to the Ukrainian government, to resume offensive operations in Nikolaev, Krigoyrog and other directions has failed during unsuccessful attacks on Arkhangelskoye, Olgino and Ternovye Prodi, the enemy suffered heavy losses and was pushed back by Russian troops. Now I should say that the Ukrainians have previously claimed to have captured Arkhangelskoye and Ternovye Prodi. Uh, but the Russian Ministry of Defense is clearly denying this. Anyway, to continue, battalion of the 57th um, uh, Ukrainian Motorized Infantry Brigade has been defeated near Surkhoi Stavok. The elimination of its remnants is currently being completed. Now, I want to um, draw particular attention to that sentence. The elimination of its remnants is currently being completed. And then it continues, the Russian Defence Ministry report continues by saying 12 tanks supplied to the Kiev regime. As I said, that's what the 
Russians call the Ukrainian government, by Poland have been sent across the Ingulets River to unblock, now notice the word unblock, the U Ukrainian armed forces units. Heavy fire from Russian troops destroyed some of the tanks. Several tanks blew themselves up on their own minefield in the course of a disorderly retreat. Only five Ukrainian tanks were able to make it back deep into Ukrainian-controlled territory. During two days of unsuccessful attacks in Nikolaev, Krivoy Rog and other directions, Ukrainian forces lost four combat aircraft, two Sukhoi 25s, one Sukhoi 24 and one MiG-29. Three Ukrainian Mil-8 helicopters have been shot down in the air. And then the report finishes. Russian troops have destroyed, and again I would stress the word destroyed, 63 Ukrainian tanks, 59 infantry fighting vehicles, 48 other armoured fighting vehicles, 14 pickup and pickups with high with large caliber machine guns and over 1,700 Ukrainian soldiers. Now, there's a few points to take from this. Um, the first is that the Russians have identified another unit, the 57th unit, um, 57th Motorized Infantry Brigade, which they say has been defeated near Suhoi Stavok. Suhoi Stavok is this small hamlet in the Ardivka uh, zone of operations the, um, near the Ingulets River. Now, what happened on the first day of this offensive is that the Ukrainian forces crossed a pontoon bridge at Ardivka, which is a town south of the Ingulets River that they captured some weeks ago that they advanced and captured another town called, uh, village rather I should say, uh, these are villages more than towns, uh, called Lozoye, which is slightly to the east of Ardika, and then they pushed south towards Suhoi Stavok, which is a very small settlement, uh, a hamlet, apparently essentially deserted nowadays. Now, importantly, Ardika and Lozoye, I'm probably getting their names wrong, or mispronouncing them, um, are apparently in a forested zone close to the Ingulets River. Suhoi Stavok, by contrast, is in the open steppe. And when Ukrainian forces have tried to occupy Suhoi Stavok, as they did both on the first day and apparently on the second day, which is to say yesterday, they then become the targets of enormous Russian artillery and aircraft strikes because essentially they've moved out into the open and attempts therefore by the Ukrainians to occupy and establish themselves in Suhoi Stavok uh, don't go well at all. Now up to, up to that point everything has been fairly clear but this is where I think the Russian Ministry of Defence report begins to become quite interesting because what we see is that the Russians are saying that they are eliminating the remnants of this 57th Motorized Infantry Brigade and the Ukrainians sent 12 tanks across the pontoon bridge they have near Ardika to try to help this brigade, the remnants of this brigade, which the Russians say is blocked. But these tanks were massively attacked by the Russian artillery and seven of them were destroyed either because they were destroyed by the artillery, the Russian artillery, or because some of them at least destroyed themselves by 
trying to cross one of Ukraine's one of one of the minefields that the Ukrainians have themselves established. Now that would be a minefield close to Ardika, which the Ukrainians have successfully defended against repeated Russian attacks over the last few weeks. And it's logical that they would have established minefields around this village. And the Russians say that uh, some of these some of these Ukrainian tanks uh, got caught up in this Ukrainian minefield and were destroyed. Now, all of this is very detailed and that does make it look plausible, but it does come from Russian sources and the degree of corroboration we have obviously is limited. However, that's not to say that there is no corroboration at all. We're starting to get photographs and pictures appearing from the battlefields and they do show knocked out tanks and those who understand these things say that these are indeed uh, uh, Polish T-72 tanks. The Soviet Union was the country that developed and designed and built the T-72 tank but back in the 1970s Poland obtained a license to build a T-72 in Poland itself and apparently the Poles continue to make it or at least they've made an adaption of it and the Polish military continues to use it and some 200 of these tanks as we know have been supplied to Ukraine and some of these tanks it's some of these tanks that are being used to fight in this area of uh, the Kherson counteroffensive, <laughs> and by the way, the Russians also refer to armored vehicles. And again, some of the pictures that we've seen do show armored vehicles, which have obviously been supplied by the Western powers, including M113 armored personnel carriers. These are uh, aluminium. Um, these are made from aluminium, date from the 1950s. They were first designed by the US military in the 1950s, and many assume them to be unsuitable for this type of warfare. But anyway, they do seem to have been deployed in this area. But anyway, so we are getting some corroboration, some photographic corroboration of some of these Russian claims. And let's just now go to what the Russians are saying. The Russians say that they have destroyed a total of 63 tanks and 59 infantry fighting vehicles and 48 other armoured fighting vehicles since this offensive began. And they're also claiming that 1,700 Ukrainian soldiers have been destroyed. Now, I'm not, as I said, quite sure destroyed means in this context, whether it means killed or wounded, but destroyed is a pretty emphatic word. And I have to say, to me, it sounds like the Russians are claiming that they've killed over, over 1,700 soldiers. Now, these are Russian claims. We don't know about how many Rus Ukrainian soldiers have actually been killed in this fighting. The Ukrainians have not provided casualty figures. But I have to say that with every passing hour, it is becoming clearer to me that Ukrainian losses are indeed extremely high. And we're now getting pictures from Odessa of long lines of civilians uh, coming to donate blood to help the Ukrainian soldiers who have been severely wounded in this fighting. But I want to come back again to this Russian Defence Ministry report because it contains some very interesting words. It talks about the elimination of the remnants of this 57th Infantry Brigade and it talks about an attempt to unblock the Ukrainian Armed Forces units south of the Ingulets River, which is what happened when the Ukrainians sent these 12 tanks trundling across the pontoon bridge. Now, 
when I did my video about this offensive, this Hurson counteroffensive yesterday, a number of people on the threads pointed out that the map picture shows a Ukrainian salient um, between Ardeka and Lozovie, and I'm, as I say, getting the names of these places wrong, I'm sure, and going further south to this village of Suhoi Stavok. It's one which is surrounded on three sides by Russian controlled territory and which has a river, <laughs> the Ingulets River, at its back. And the only connecting point between the Ukrainian forces in this bridgehead, if you like, is of course a pontoon bridge. Now pontoon bridges, I'm told, are fairly difficult to destroy because they can be quickly repaired, they're m modular by definition. But having said that, it does suggest that communications at the moment are fairly precarious. Now, <coughs> if one reads this report in a certain way, it could indeed imply that the Ukrainians are in effect surrounded and trapped in this particular bridgehead and that the Russians are working to try to destroy the Ukrainian forces in this bridgehead. Note the words elimination of remnants and also the words unblock. Now I, I have to say nothing is however quite as straightforward as it can sometimes look especially on a map. So I, I'm going to be extremely careful about this. It seems to me that one possibility is that the Ukrainians will, instead of put, trying repeatedly to push on to this village and cross the open step, that they will do something which Dima at the Military Summary Channel was talking about weeks ago, which is that they'll stick to the forested area around the river itself, that they'll continue to build up their forces south of the river, and then they'll try and advance through the forests, taking one settlement after another. That would be consistent, by the way, with what the Ukrainians themselves are saying about a very slow grinding operation. So the Russian reports do rather suggest a um, Ukrainian forces now surrounded and trapped. But I think we have to wait for this situation to develop before we can say that definitely. Having said this, what the Russians are also talking about is enormous Ukrainian losses. Now, as I said, I can't confirm this number of 1,700 Ukrainian soldiers killed that um, the Russian Ministry of Defense is citing. Um, however, in the past, when corroboration from the Ukrainians has appeared about in Ukrainian losses in individual battles, they have tended, surprisingly, somewhat surprisingly, to bear out the Russian reports. And if we're talking about losses of equipment, losses of tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, armoured personnel carriers. Well, that does seem to be the kind of information which I would expect the Russians to be able to collate quite accurately. Now, all of this points to enormous losses being suffered by Ukraine in pursuit of this operation. And if it is indeed the case that the Ukrainian troops are trapped, then those losses could be bigger still, could become bigger still. Regardless, if the Ukrainians are suffering losses on this scale, if they are indeed losing 500 men a day killed, 
as the Russians claim, then it seems to me that their ability to sustain this offensive must be extremely limited. Let's go back several months to the events in April, May, when many of you may remember that there was all those pictures that were circulating of a Russian attempt across the Seversky Donetsk River as part of the fighting in and around Severodonetsk and Lizichansk. And there were pictures of knocked out Russian tanks and infantry fighting vehicles. And there were all sorts of excited claims in the Western media that an entire Russian battalion had been destroyed and that the Russians might have lost 500 men in a single day. Those reports, by the way, turned out to be um, exaggerated. But there was no doubt at all that the Russians did suffer significant losses over the course of that crossing. And of course, the media played it up in the West, played it up for all it's worth. Well, all the indications are that the losses that the Ukrainians are suffering in this crossing of the Ingulets River is an order of magnitude, perhaps even several orders of magnitude, greater. And the Russians eventually concluded that this attempt to cross the Seversky Donetsk River in that particular place was um, ill-advised, and they changed the axis of their advance and they focused instead on capturing the town of Popaznaya, and they did eventually capture the town of Popaznaya, and thereafter the Ukrainian position in Lugansk region progressively collapsed. So the Russians drew the appropriate conclusions that an advance on Severodonetsk and Lizichansk across the uh, uh, Seversky Donetsk River via pontoon crossings and all that was ill-advised, and they adjusted their tactics. Surely, given the extent of Ukrainian losses, and given the very limited nature of what has been achieved, the Ukrainians ought to be doing the same. Alternatively, if they continue to press on with this counteroffensive in Kherson region in this kind of way, then it seems to me that they're just going to increase their losses to the point where those losses become almost impossible to sustain. And quite conceivably, the situation will then arise when the Russians will themselves find themselves in a position where they can launch a counteroffensive against much weakened Ukrainian forces in this area. Well, that's how it looks to me. But it seems that's not what's going to happen. Now, we got reports um, again overnight that there's been another meeting between President Zelensky and General Zeluzny. And these reports, again, cannot be corroborated. And one does often wonder what the source of this information is but they're not inherently implausible. Because what these reports say is that General Zeluzny, who apparently was against this Kherson counteroffensive from the start, advised Zelensky to call it off. He said that the losses on the first day have been inordinate and unsustainable, and that the result is that it's better to pull back and to concentrate Ukrainian forces elsewhere. And these same reports say entirely predictably and following the pattern of this war right through that President Zelensky overruled, overruled General Zeluzhny and instructed him to continue the offensive, presumably regardless of whatever losses there might be. So it looks like the Ukrainian forces are going to continue their various attempts to launch this counteroffensive. Perhaps they might achieve some kind of success somewhere. The Russian Ministry of Defense says they're not doing so at the moment. And in the meantime, they're suffering extremely heavy losses. 
which they can ill afford, even if some of the numbers that the Russian Ministry of Defence is giving in terms of men killed might be too high. Why are the Ukrainians doing this? Well, in my last programme, I gave some explanations. I said there was pressure from the British and that um, General, uh, President Zelensky may be worried that support for the war is flagging in Ukraine itself and also in Europe, where an economic crisis is now intensifying. Well, that was my suggestions yesterday. Going to the London Times this morning, I found an article which I am not going to read through, partly because it's behind a paywall, but partly because it doesn't tell us anything we don't already know, and it's also filled with all kinds of claims and assertions and speculations which I think are unfounded. But consider its headline. Kiev or Kiev is desperate to show allies war is not a lost cause. In other words, Ukraine is gambling. It's gambling with counteroffensives in Kherson region, possible counteroffensives in Kharkov region. It's throwing away lives of its soldiers. It's throwing away material, tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, armoured vehicles, which are already in desperately short supply. There's a good article, by the way, from the moon of Alabama uh, today, which draws on information from the New York Times, which in turn shows how desperately short of equipment some Ukrainian military units actually are. Anyway, Ukraine is throwing away the lives of its soldiers, is throwing away material that it has only in limited quantities because it is desperate. It has to show to its allies that the war is not a lost cause, that Ukraine still has a chance somehow of winning this war, even though what the definition of victory is, I've long since ceased to understand. And that's not coming from me. That's the headline of an article in the London Times, a newspaper which is 100% supportive of Ukraine, which gives breathless, triumphalist accounts of every Ukrainian advance, and which, if you were to read the London Times, well, you'd get, I'll simply say, a very different understanding of the direction of the war than you would from listening to me. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. So the London Times is talking about Kiev being desperate and it needs to show its allies that the war is not a lost cause. Now, that brings us to a few other facts about what we've learnt from these reports, these Russian military defence reports, and also, by the way, from the photographic evidence. I said that the photographic evidence has confirmed that the tanks that the U tanks that Ukraine is using in this offensive are indeed tanks supplied by Poland. And also, it seems that at least some of the armoured personnel carriers are M113s, which have also been donated by Western countries. And we see the malignant, the malign effects of that. Because even though Western countries may be giving weapons to Ukraine, from their point of view, in total good faith, they will want some reassurance from Ukraine that their all this all this material, all these weapon systems that they're giving to Ukraine is being put to effective use and is achieving outcomes. So Poland is supplying tanks, Britain is supplying, well, 
all kinds of weapon systems. Others are supplying M113s. They all want to see that Ukraine is doing something effective with these weapons. So Ukraine, as a result, is being pushed into launching offensives like the one in Kherson at inordinate cost in the lives of its men and against the better judgment of its generals. It has to do that because otherwise it will worry. It is inevitably going to start being concerned that its Western aid donors are becoming disappointed, that they're starting to have doubts about Ukraine's ability to sustain and continue the war, let alone win in the war, in which case the aid might stop, in which case, of course, Ukraine will collapse. Now, we've seen this pattern before. It was very, very much the case, for example, in Vietnam. I remember years and years ago reading a long um, book about the US involvement in Cambodia in the early 1970s and how the flood of US weapons in Cambodia actually caused the Cambodian military forced, obliged the Cambodian military to do things which they knew were unwise, but which they felt they had to do, because if they didn't do them, their American ally might become increasingly agitated and concerned and might decide at some point to go away. And we've seen this happen in so many other places. We've seen this in Afghanistan. We've seen this in Iraq. We've seen this time after time after time. When one country becomes dependent on another country, it is often forced to do things that it might not itself do if left to its own judgment, but which it has to do in order to appease, in order to keep happy that other country. And it seems to me that Ukraine is now being manoeuvred into exactly this position. They're launching offensives in Kherson region, probably offensives before long in Kharkiv region, which their military is not happy about, where the military would prefer to husband Ukraine's limited resources, uh, but they're being forced to do it losing men, having men die in battle, having men wounded in battle, because people in Washington, in London, in Warsaw, far from the battlefields, might start to question the sense of the war, of supporting Ukraine in this war, if Ukraine didn't do these things. I think it's a dreadful tragedy, and it demonstrates a point which, by the way, others have made. Um, Brian Boletic, uh, the new Atlas, makes it all the time, which is that Ukraine, in fighting for what it claims is its independence from Russia, has actually lost its independence, or at least its freedom to make its own decisions in its own interests. It now has to, instead, make decisions which are in effect imposed on it by the obligations it has taken out with the nations, the much more powerful nations of the West. Now, I think, I've said this so many times, I think that Ukraine ought to revisit this issue. It ought to say to itself, the price it's paying is much too high. It can't afford or sustain a war in this kind of way. The Kherson counteroffensive is not going as planned, whatever that plan was. <laughs> the losses are exorbitant, as General Zeluzhny is apparently advising. It can't hold on to Donbass indefinitely. The time surely has come to sit down and make peace. But we see and this is the great tragedy, that the, po the politics of it mean that that is not what Ukraine is prepared to do. Now, 
I've talked about Ukraine's actions. Of course, the war is not only in Kherson region. Probably the weight of the fighting, the heaviest fighting, is actually still going on in Donbass. Though it seems to me that the encounter battle that, hap that has happened um, in and around this hamlet has probably been, by some orders of magnitude, the most intense encounter battle that there's been so far in this war. But it is in Donbass that the Ukra Russian offensive grinds on. Contrary to what I was thought yesterday, the Russians still haven't completely cleared Kodema. The Wagner group that has got the job of trying to clear Kodema is finding it apparently tough going. The Ukrainians even trying to launch a counter attack there, which apparently failed. But it does seem as if the Russians are making a systematic, are, 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 are succeeding systematically in clearing the ring road around Donetsk city and that they are also getting ever closer to surrounding Avdivka um, and also Ugledar. So in Donbass the situation is becoming increasingly bad and there's reports now that the Russian forces in Donbass and elsewhere in Ukraine are going to be heavily reinforced before very long. We've had this extraordinary, all these reports, all these very strange reports about this third corps of either 15,000 men, if you believe the British, or 60,000 men, if you believe some of the Russians, uh, which is now um, assembling near Ukraine's borders in Rostov region. And the British Ministry of Defence, in a bulletin today, a summary, which, by the way, seem to give a very tepid report of what's happening in the Kherson offensive. It said that Ukraine has pushed back the Russians in a few places. It doesn't seem like a resounding victory, but anyway, that's what it said. Uh, by the way, that is true, but of course, it is only a limited part of the truth. Anyway, the, 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 the British Ministry of Defence, talking about this Third Corps, spoke about it being used to reinforce, to plug the Russian gaps, um, which supposedly the Russians have suffered, according to doctrine, whatever that means. But anyway, the fact is that this Third Corps is there. It, I'm not sure how big it is. I'm not sure how many troops are involved, whether it's 15,000 or 40,000 or 60,000. I've had all of these numbers thrown around, but it does seem as if there's a very powerful force that is gradually being assembled in Rostov and which will no doubt be fed into the battle lines before very long, into the into Donbass, into Kherson region, as part of some Russian offensive, who knows. And this Third Corps is something of an enigma, but about one force that is indeed now being redeployed to Donbass and which is going to be involved in the fighting there, about its existence there is no doubt. And that is that we're now getting film from Chechnya which shows that the Chechen forces, about which we've heard very little over the last few weeks, I suspect that after the um, capture of Lizichansk, they were withdrawn back to um, Chechnya and rested there and reinforced there. Anyway, they're now apparently heading back to Donbass. <laughs> and again, we don't know how large these forces are, but they did play a very important, a very critical role in the fighting in Severodonetsk and Lizichansk. And one gets the sense that they are going to be used in the fighting in Donbass. And there's some suggestions, some indications from comments that the uh, leader of Chechnya, a man called Ramzan Kadyrov, who's now Lieutenant General in the Russian Armed Forces, by the way. Kadyrov has been talking increasingly about Siversk, and one gets the sense that that's probably where these Chechen forces are going to be deployed. So we could be seeing a major Russian push towards Siversk as well.
even as the Russians gradually mop up the Ukrainian defences opposite Donetsk city. That will then leave the Russians strongly positioned to complete the encirclement of Bakhmut city, which, as I've said, is the linchpin of Ukrainian defences in Donbass. Meanwhile, obviously, the Russians will have to deal with whatever offensive the U Ukrainians launch or don't launch towards Izium, also presumably across the Seversky Donetsk River. We'll see what happens there and whether that offensive even materializes. Anyway, that seems to me to be a fair summary of the situation on the battlefronts, but I just want to touch off touch on two particular topics which have been brought up. We've now received reports from the Ukrainians, they've been widely publicised in the Western media, that the Ukrainians have been setting up dummies of high Mars launchers, and that it's these dummies, these wooden dummies, uh, that the Russians have been destroying, not the high Mars launchers it's themselves. Well, that could be true. How, how would I know, one way or, or the other? I'm going to express a little scepticism about this. Firstly, um, if you are using wooden dummies, why publicise the fact? Surely you would want to conceal the fact that you're using wooden dummies. Um, it seems to me that this story has been conjured up now in order to try to counter Russian claims that they've destroyed eight high Mars launchers rather than perhaps to refute Russian claims that they have destroyed eight high Mars launchers. If you really are using dummies as decoys, then presumably if this is a successful tactic, you'd want to conceal the fact so that the Russians will not take precautions to work out whether there are what, what they're destroying are decoys or not. And of course, now by publishing the fact that you're making these wooden decoys, well, you've alerted the Russians to this fact. Now, having said that, that of course opens up the other question about whether the Russians really would be fooled if, by wooden decoys of high Mars launch vehicles and whatever. Now, I think that once upon a time during the Second World War, this sort of thing used to be done extensively. The Iraqis, as I remember, also did it in the first Iraq war, create de decoys, inflatable tanks, rubber tanks, wooden models of things. And no doubt it works up to a point. But I would have thought that now, with the kind of warfare that we have, modern warfare that we have with drones operating on an extensive scale, with other electronic systems working, with counter-battery radars also working, the Russians would probably be very careful before they launched a missile strike on what they thought was a high Mars launcher to make sure in advance that it really was a high Mars launcher. So. I'm not refuting this claim. I can't do so. I don't have the information. I just would suggest that people be a little careful before they simply assumed it was true. It does seem to have come out, been published now in a rather suspicious way. It's the sort of thing, it seems to me, that you publish when a war is won, which this war isn't for Ukraine at least at the moment, rather than in the middle of the war alerting your enemy to a particular tactic, which does make me wonder whether the tactic is actually being used to any effect at all. Anyway, that's the first thing. The second is I mentioned drones. Well, we're now hearing more and more about how Russian aircraft have taken off from Iran with large numbers of Iranian drones, and that these Iranian drones are now going to be deployed on the battlefields, though there are also reports that the Russians are having difficulties in using them. Now, this may be true. All I would say is, and I've expressed scepticism about this story in the past, that so far 
I haven't seen any independent corroboration at all for the existence of these drones. Both the Russians and the Iranians up to this point have denied this story. And unless and until someone is able to show me a Iranian drone operating in Ukraine and or until and unless the Russians and the Iranians both confirm that these drones are indeed being used, I'm going to basically reserve judgment and wait and see. Now, lots of other things are going on. There's a deepening crisis in Iraq. Um, the green zone in Baghdad was stormed. There were brief reports that the US Embassy might be evacuated. Its air defense systems were activated. This is the US Embassy in Iraq. Most of the protesters who stormed the, um, the, the green zone, the Iraqi protesters who are supporters of the dissident Shia cleric Muqtada al-Sadr, they've now apparently withdrawn. But it's clear that Iraq is going through a period of intense turmoil. And one does wonder what that means for the Middle East, for the supply of oil, for any US plans for a war against Iran. And in the meantime, it's clear that Iran and Russia are forging ahead with their relations. And it's also clear, this is irrespective of this drone story, and it's also clear that Iran is now threatening again to accelerate, intensify its nuclear enrichment program. And there's more talk about Israel launching strikes of some kind, airstrikes against Iran. So the situation there is becoming extremely difficult. Meanwhile, we've learned that the Nord Stream pipeline, Nord Stream 1, is now switched off. Um, Olaf Scholz went to Canada to try to get LNG supplies from Canada. He wasn't successful. There's some talk that Europe might be able to fill up its reserves to 80% level before winter begins. The trouble with that is that's not going to be enough to get through the winter. Certainly it's not enough to get through the winter by itself. What tends to happen, and I think this is a point which people don't understand, or at least which Robert Habeck hasn't perhaps fully understood, it seems to me that he seems to have assumed that if he filled up the gas reserves in Germany um, to 100% before the winter, that would mean that Germany could get through the winter without having to import more gas, and that would enable him to switch off gas from Russia and claim that Germany has gained energy independence from Russia. Well, it doesn't quite work like that because the reserves, these gas reserves, are not intended to be used in that way. They are designed on the assumption that there will continue to be an uninterrupted gas flow from Russia. So if that gas flow isn't happening, and at the moment it isn't, at least not through Nord Stream 1, and of course not through Nord Stream 2, or the Yamal pipeline, or one of the spurs of the Druzhba pipeline, it's reduced to a trickle. Now what's going to happen in winter is that those reserves are going to fall very, very fast, and that's inevitably going to cause alarm, and you're going to start to see, again, gas prices spiking. And gas prices are, of course, already spiking across Europe. Again, not for the first time. I get the sense that Mr. Habeck and others like him in the German government haven't, and in the European Commission have not fully understood how markets work. Anyway, we're, we're getting that sort of sense of crisis starting to grow. And of course, the Europeans are now, it turns out, looking to all sorts of places to import natural gas from. And of course, they can't get it from Canada in the quantities that they need. The Canadians have ruled that out. Uh, US supplies of natural of liquefied natural gas are falling because the US now needs its LNG for itself. 
its own reserves are critically low. The administration is worried about shortages in the United States, and so it's husbanding reserves both of LNG and of oil, and trying to keep LNG and oil within the United States. And of course, as I always said, Robert Harbeck claims that he made some kind of giant deal with Qatar. Well, they, those have turned, they, those have been shown to be completely untrue. They have had no reality. They've been essentially exposed as fiction. So the Europeans have been looking east and they've been importing LNG from, of all places, China. Now, there's an absolutely extraordinary article, a bizarre article in Zero Hedge, which draws upon information from an article in the Financial Times, which asks this question, how is China able to export LNG to Europe? Well, the short answer is it's increasing imports of LNG from Russia and it's exporting them, it's re-exporting that same LNG to Europe at a substantial premium. So the Russians have a customer for their LNG which is China and the Chinese are then reselling this same LNG to Europe at a big premium. The Chinese are doing very well from this business, the Russians are doing well too. The Europeans are buying LNG from China, which they could buy directly from Russia, but at a much higher price. Now, this is an extraordinary article, um, but it passes the Financial Times article in a way that, that, that it works from, but it passes it in a way that makes me think that the claim it's making that this LNG that's going to Europe from Ch via China is actually ultimately Russian LNG. It makes me think that this is probably true. In which case, all I can say is that the whole thing is becoming a complete nonsense. And it isn't just becoming a nonsense because the Europeans are importing Russian gas from China at a markup when, in the absence of sanctions, they could have imported it directly from the Russians themselves without having to pay this markup. It also shows, and this is the point the uh, Zero Hedge article is making, it also shows that um, the Europeans, far from reducing their dependence on the Russians, remain dependent on the Russians for their gas, but this time through an intermediary, China, which is allied to Russia and increasingly hostile to themselves. In other words, this doesn't make geopolitical sense either. I'm going to make a guess, a further guess by the way, that come the winter, especially with the Chinese efforts to get their economy restarted, their, their mighty industrial machine whirring again, um, we're going to see demand in China for bo both oil and LNG grow, which means oil prices will increase. I've been saying this already, but I suspect also that we will see these LNG supplies from China to Europe trickle to a stop. Anyway, it's a bizarre article and it demonstrates how illogical this sanctions war has become. Perhaps there's some people in Europe who are beginning to understand this because for the first time and a little to my surprise it looks as if um, a particularly bad idea for sanctions, for further sanctions, has that's been floating around Europe has been rejected and this was this visa ban idea. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that 
the visa ban idea isn't going to be implemented at some point. But the Hungarian foreign minister says that it's been the idea has been dropped because it ran into too much opposition. I'd love to know from whom, by the way, and I wonder how that is consistent with the earlier reports we were hearing that the European Union is about to cancel its visa agreements with the Russians. Anyway, we'll find out, no doubt, before very long what's going on there. But anyway, a darkening picture in Europe, growing absurdities in the sanctions war. Meanwhile, in Ukraine itself, something else which may be important is happening. It seems that the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, is finally sending inspectors to the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. It seems that Ukraine, it can only be Ukraine, is continuing to shell the nuclear power plant. We'll see what the inspectors decide and what report they make and what happens. But there are some people who are interpreting this Ukrainian shelling of the nuclear power plant as an attempt to try to prevent the inspectors from going there. Well, we will find out about that one way or the other. But anyway, that's where it seems to me things stand at the moment. Ukrainian offensives, at least one in Kherson region, which are inflicting appalling losses on Ukraine itself, disproportionately high losses for marginal gains, and which the Russians claim are failing, driven by political demands from the West, made in disregard of military tactical considerations. And a continuing Russian offensive in Donbass, a gathering an increase in Russian forces in Ukraine and, of course, a deepening economic crisis in Europe. A difficult situation altogether, but I've made my feelings about that known in many programmes and I'm not going to repeat myself further about all of that today. So this is the end of today's video. It's already almost reached an hour, so I think this is a good point to stop. No, more videos from me soon um, as situations evolve. I'll try and keep you updated and let you know what my opinions of events are. In the meantime, have a very good day. Remember, you can find us on other platforms, Rumble, Locals, um, uh, Telegram, Odyssey, BitChute. You can also uh, support us via Patreon and subs subscribe star. Don't overlook our shop where we have all kinds of great things you can buy. Our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts and all the rest. And last but not least, if you've liked, liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today more from me soon and have a very good day.